Hi, my name is Kaya and I'm part of the root building team here at Revit Games. Today I'm going to be giving you an overview of the root building process that we've taken for our latest route, the Isle of Wight. Um, some of you may have watched our other devlog videos and be familiar with the process used in TS1. Today we're going to be going over the process used when we're using the Unreal Engine. So first of all, we like to divide the route into tiles. And you can see as I click here, that yellow line is where one tile ends and another begins. You can also see it as a nice purple box that highlights the area. So the first thing in is the track. And then we begin to place the roads and sculpt the landscape after that. We use real world height data and reference images for getting the heights correct. Um, so we'll often use Google Earth and just compare the two heights. So I can turn the Google overlay on and let you see how we position the different items in the world. Um, let's check the opacity. There we are. So as you can see, we place everything as it would be in real life. And we try to make sure everything's as accurate as possible. When using Google Earth, there's also a little icon at the bottom here that will tell us like the elevation. So we'll use that and compare it by using an eyedropper tool and it will just tell us the different heights. So we work off of the tra track height that we've added to our game because we know that's the most accurate. And if there's any discrepancies, we'll like add and subtract where necessary. We often have people that go and survey the routes as well because for the Isle of Wight, for instance, we didn't have track view. So a lot of our Switzerland routes will actually be able to go down in Google Earth to the track. But for this, we had to rely a lot on reference images and videos. And this is also really helpful for the artists to create different items. So I've got a wee image here. This house, for instance, uh, Signal Hut even. Um, as you can see, it's very true to the photo because we like to create everything to be as accurate as possible. So for adding our roads and any other items, we'll often have to edit the terrain. I'm going to fly over here so I can give you a little demo of some of our sculpting tools. I think I cleared out a little patch if I can find it. So the different tools that we have, we can sculpt the terrain to raise and lower it make the brush size smaller. So we can raise it up or lower it down. We can smooth out any of those polygon edges because we don't want that. We can take a sample of different heights. So again, that's useful when we're using Google Earth and different reference points. We can get the exact height we want and just put that across the board. And even like a ramp tool, which is sometimes useful if you just want to get like a quite a steep gradient all in one. For the roads, we also have a built-in loft tool. So if I get a road spline, so we can use the loft tool to snap the terrain up to meet the roads. So this is useful to make sure that nothing is floating above ground and just to get that nice even finish. The process for route building is very similar to that of TS1, but instead of working out from the track inwards, we tend to work from our near touchable scenery, which is where the player can explore. I've got a little image here. So all by the track where the player can walk and then out to the near things, so where your camera can fly out to. And then lastly, the far scenery, so that we can give the impression that the world extends right beyond the horizon. And with that, we need to do some terrain painting to make it look like there's a lot going on, even in the distance. So for underpainting the trees, I like to use our color darken tool. And this will take, whether it's grass or mud or whatever is placed on the ground and just add a darker layer to it. So I like to do quite a rough outline first of all and then I will work my way inwards and 
create it even lighter and use different brush types. So this alpha tool, it gives more of a random effect. Um, and then you can see it's kind of getting it as if the light is streaming through the trees. So I like to build up the scene that way. And then if it's going into a field like this, um, you can use the color darken just to add tiny little patches. It's probably a bit too light. Um, a few little patches that you can then blend in properly. And then even add things like mud. And this one likes quite a high tool strength, if I'm remembering right. Do, do, do. Yeah, about 0 0.8 for the mud setting. And just build upon each layer like that. So I'm going to recreate this little scene with you guys. So this is the before. And let me start deleting some stuff. So now we have a little empty section. and. How we'd build that up is first of all start adding some terrain paint so there was a bit of mud on the ground to begin with um, so we just add a little bit of that we can make it like lighter and darker as we see fit so make that brush size a bit smaller start adding a bit darker patches and using that color darken tool again can make it a little wet looking as well which is nice and then we'll start to add some of the grass and the weeds in on top so to start just this kind of lower grass and um, this is usually seen just at the side of the tracks and um, the longer grass and the weeds we use for like deeper within forests or anywhere that's kind of overgrown so We'll just add some of this around the outside to begin with. Then some of the longer grass on top. So coming out from these trees here, um, add some grass that's kind of merging with this industrial area. And some by the bushes over here. I'll add a couple of the weeds just now, but sometimes it's better to go in at the end when you've got like your different scenery items placed, but I think we can just add some on the outskirts here and next we need some more of these assets so I'm just gonna search for this and here we are so if I place some of these vans around here that have just like came in off this road I think they usually come in all right and like on the ground but it's always best to check just make sure the wheels aren't sunk in or anything like that. So this one looks okay. Uh, let's get another one as well. I'm trying to remember what this scene looked like before. That's why you should always go to Google Earth. So I'll maybe do that just now, actually. Yeah, it's just a kind of industrial scene. So we try to keep as true to Google Earth as possible, but often with areas like this, like a construction site, um, we can just add in clutter items that make sense. So just different kind of piles of bricks and rubble that's lying around. Whereas a station building, like you're gonna get like the same thing every time you visit really. So that's more precise, but I think this area we can just go ahead and add some different clutter items. But I can see is that wheel sunk in a little bit. So let's raise that. Ah, see that's the trouble. Then you end up with something that's flying. So let's see. I think the terrain itself needs moved, that's the problem. So if I go here and I'll use this eyedropper tool to sample the height of this piece of terrain where we thought the wheel was okay and just sort of flatten it out around here. I'll make it quite wide so that I can smooth down the sides as well without interfering. So smooth that back down. And that's fine. Good stuff. Next, we're wanting some of these um, rubble clutter items. So we've got this kind of gravelly one. And if my memory served me right, there was a sandy one before. So yep, a uh, kind of sand pile. I'll just place these roughly for now. A couple of these. Even add a little bit of some litter in as well, kind of around the skip. We can just 
rotate these and position these places that make sense. Maybe sink this one in because it's quite big. Put this kind of over here. Just make sure it's not flying off the ground. There we are. And it's still looking quite empty, so again, it might be worth coming in with some more of this foliage. So if I go here, add a couple of those weeds in again. So let's see. Yeah, it already makes it look a bit more full. We can again come in with some different terrain paint, so maybe some even darker mud. If I turn this off and use it at its full setting, it's gives more of a kind of wet and walked on effect, I feel. So just some different colours in there. And again, around this fence area, I had some more kind of weeds poking through, but we need to be careful that we don't get um, going too much onto the path or anything like this. So sometimes we'll put in different foliage by hand if it's like really close. But we prefer to use this tool just because it's less intensive and it's also quite handy just to spray down a big chunk. So add some along the fence here. For different areas you would take different approaches. Um, an industrial area like this is kind of about placing clutter and getting that believable feel. Um, some other rural areas it's like more just I guess the different foliage that you'd more worry about. And like I said before for stations and anywhere that's really good for references on Google Earth, we tend to use that and stay pretty true to how it is. So I'll probably leave this scene here. Um, it still needs a little bit of fleshing out, but it does take quite a bit of time to get everything matching up. And I'm pretty sure there was like some darkened things up here, but it gives you a rough idea of the sort of process that we go through. The graphic that I showed earlier outlining the touchable near and far zones. Um, the root builders kind of determine this and it's usually by the collision walls. So here, um, I think the collision walls are on the stations themselves. Sometimes it's a little bit further out. Um, so this is considered the sort of touchable zone would be this area in here because this is where the player will walk around and explore. And we want to make sure like everything is absolutely pristine I mean, we want that for all of the game, but this is the area that people will be right up and about. And then the next area, which is, it's the kind of near zone, is you might see these these big blue walls. They are not there in game, but this is for the camera collision. So the player's camera can fly out right to here. Um, if I turn these off, just so you can see more like in game. Um, so this would be what's classed as the near zone, but anything beyond that, like the player or the player camera shouldn't really be going there. So it's just to more give the impression that there's more scenery just beyond the horizon. And um, cause we don't want there to be too much in the scene and then it'll have like problems like making the game run in that. So we try to make sure that we focus our attention on everything the player is actually going to be interacting with. So that's how that little graphic works for us. But yeah, just um, as we build the route, we kind of just know by the collision walls, like what will become like near and far scenery. And then in the near zones, like we'll have houses with higher levels of detail. And then as you get further out, um, less details required, like there's maybe less shadows or just kind of slightly less intensive textures and things like that. The differences between working in TS1 and the Unreal Engine. Um, I actually didn't work on TS1, so I might not be the best person to ask, but I've heard there's kind of pros and cons to both. Um, Unreal Engine, like the tools, they're really good and you get like a lot of freedom, but um, I feel there was also quite a good degree of control in the old engine from what I'm hearing. Um, sometimes like raising and lowering the terrain, it's a lot more fluid in this, which has its pros and cons, like you might have seen earlier with the the car, like the slightest sort of bump in the terrain means that something will look as if it's not um, properly sunk in or anything like that. So definitely pros and cons to both. As you can see, there's like quite a lot of um, freedom, which is good when you're um, wanting to get 
something like really precise, but at the same time, it's a lot of room for error as well. So a lot of attention to detail needed and making sure we get those good QA checks in as well, just to make sure everything is working as it should. The root is divided into different parts and we call these parts tiles. Um, this is to give us a good system so that we know where we should be working and so that we don't try and work somewhere and overwrite anyone else's work. So I've got a tile map here and the tiles you see in the middle correspond to the track. So I think we're at St. John's, so minus two, minus five and minus one, minus five, that is these tiles here. And each person working on the route will be given a color. So at the moment, I am this teal blue color and you'll find me down here. And the tile system is mainly just to make sure everyone is working where they're supposed to be and so that we can see the progress of the route as well. Because you'll notice these are colored um, yellow and orange. So that's the completion key that we'll use. And it's basically if we want our work to be checked over by our manager or just each other, we'll see how far along we think we are. And um, it just gives us a better idea for what we should be highlighting to others. Because if someone was just maybe 25% done, you don't want to be saying, oh, this isn't in yet, or this thing is floating, because they probably know that at this stage. But when it's getting towards 75 to 99%, there shouldn't really be any room for error at this point. So that's where you get quite um, critical in making sure you've got that keen eye for detail and making sure everything's okay. I think I've got a top-down view of the route here. So this red is because I've been clicking about those tiles today. Um, it's a good way of seeing if you've made any changes, but as you can see from these squares, um, that's again just showing a top-down view of the tiles that we work from. So the stations themselves are modelled by artists and then placed in the route. Um, this one doesn't have its placement guide on, but what we would do is we'd have something attached to the track. So just for the sake of this example, imagine this cube would be temporarily attached and then the artists would uh, work on an area that's got this so that we know how to align them when we drop it back in. Um, so they would be working on their model with the sample of track and then we'll bring it back in, drop it right on top. Um, I don't have the actual uh, placement guides to show you right now, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's usually the process we'd do. These boxes that you see around the stations, um, they won't be visible when you play the game, but they represent different things such as this little step if you fall off the platform. Um, if you approach this, then that's how you would get up. So this is kind of a collision box that would um, basically tell the game to give you like a prompt to say uh, press E or whatever key or button it might be for you to get back onto the platform. Um, these purple ones here are for where the NPCs will stand and these should align with the doors of the train and they will be spawned somewhere back here. I think there's a wee box. I don't know if I'm meant to show you this, but yeah, this is this is where the NPCs would initially spawn in and walk around the station. I haven't actually been involved with um, putting the NPCs on, but some of the other route builders in our team have. Um, this is something that they will actually deal with and making sure they can walk over bridges and just checking for anything like that is sometimes part of what the route builders do. I just haven't had an opportunity yet, but I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, that's the different collision. I think this one is just to stop players and NPCs from walking out. I'll need to double check that, but yeah, I think that's what this kind of white one is as well. The stations, the artists will set up the blueprints, like the the lights that will be built into the model. So they'll do these types of lights, but any kind of street lights that you see um, kind of further away from the stations, that's what the route builders will be putting in. So like this lamppost, um, we can kind of move this about freely. Whereas the station is, it comes like as a big chunk that the artists have modeled. So if I, if I dare move this, yeah, you can just 
move the whole thing out. These are one of the last things to go in, as well as uh, different kind of environmental sounds. And these are just the sort of finishing touches that we'll add to really bring the scene to life and make it look like a believable town or city. There's a few different types of sounds used within the games. Um, some are attached to the models, such as these bus sounds. So it's just some more ambient noise as you're driving by. You'll be able to hear this kind of bus depot here. Um, we also have big sort of sound domes like we had in TS1 and these are just placed usually just one per tile so we have like kind of rural sounds, city, coastal, um, whatever is most fitting it will just be placed pretty much in the centre and then um, the kind of distance it can hit will cover one whole tile. So that's something that we do at the end just for like finishing touches like as well as the lighting. There's various collectibles throughout the game. Um, in this one we've modelled a kind of ice cream one which is nice and fitting for the seaside Isle of Wight town. The collectibles have their own unique collectible ID. Um, various other pieces of information that goes with it. So the root builders will place down a collectible item and we'll keep a record of this to pass on to those that are programming the collectability um, like functionality of it. Uh, but we'll choose like a good location um, wherever they're scattered around. And as you can see from this big collect it icon, as we're working through the scene, we can kind of see <laughs> if it'll actually show you. Um, we can see where we've placed our different collectibles. To the left of this collectible here, you might see this um, game icon. It won't be there in game, but this is the spawn location. So the light blue arrow is where the player will face as they enter the platform. And this is if you like jump to a location, this is where you should start. So we make sure that we don't place these inside um, these sort of purple boxes, which are for the NPCs where they'll usually stand because um, you wouldn't want to spawn in and then just be like absolutely crowded. So we tried to choose something that's a nice view and something to um, let you know where you are. So um, we wouldn't want to start you just facing like into a corner or something really random like that. We want to make it in a good spot where you kind of know where you're going to head after that. So to finish off, I'll just show you a couple more reference images that we've been using. Um, this is for this section. It's quite unique in that the platform's overgrown and covered in all this nice shrubbery, so it was something a bit different to put in to the game, which was nice. I hope you've enjoyed the watching the root building process. It's a little bit different than TS1, but there's still a good deal of similarities. Um, and for more videos like this, please be sure to subscribe and check out some of our other dev vlogs.